to Novel Tea Show, the podcast where we spill the truth about the ups and downs of writing and the ins and outs of the publishing industry. I'm Alexa. I'm Lainey. I'm Kat. And this is episode one. How the heck do you write a book anyway? We'd like to start this episode by thanking our patrons for voting on this topic and stay tuned to the end of the show when we'll answer our Patreon question of the week. All right, so let's dive right in. With the huge disclaimer, a couple huge disclaimers. One, that this is a massive topic. Mm -hmm. Massive. Huge. Um, We're going to cover a lot of ground and try to cover a little bit of everything, but just know, listeners, we're going to end up doing entire episodes on a ton of these subtopics, but we wanted to cover just the overview of how do you even write a book? How even? How? It's a mystery. We're going we're gonna, <laughs> to cover we're, it. We're going to try to solve it here. <laughs> and the other big disclaimer that we want to get into before we jump into the nitty gritty is that writing a book is hard. It is very difficult. And no one can do it for you. No one has a real magical solution. We're going to offer you practical tips and ideas about ideas and getting it all down. But... The hardest part is doing the thing, and a lot of people can start a book, but so many people give up before or around Act 2, so we're going to hopefully tell you how to push through. Yeah, and another big aspect of it is finding your own process and what works for you, because every writer is going to have a different approach, and none is more valid or less valid than another if it works for you. So one thing I've learned is that writing a book is hard every single time, even though Mm. you're several books in, it's still just as hard starting it all over again. Yeah, Yeah, very true. Well, and also, every time you write a new book, often you'll discover a new process or you have to tweak your process to write a new book. But uh, that's probably overwhelming. (laughs) Anyone listening who's never written a book. So let's pull it way back uh, and talk about how the heck do you write a book assuming you've never written a book. So you're trying to write your first novel. So most of us probably start with some kind of idea, a spark of a premise or a character, something that like kicks off a potential story. So where do we get our ideas? For me, all of my ideas can stem from somewhere in a movie or a TV show, whether that be a relationship I really like that I want to explore or a premise, an overall concept, a character that I really like. All of my stories can trace back to something in a movie or TV show I've seen. I'm very often inspired by, and this sounds absolutely terrible, but terrible things. Um, So I'm, (laughs) yeah, like if I read a book and I don't, I like the concept, but I don't like the execution or same thing with a movie or a TV show where there's something there, but I see something missing, it'll often spark an idea of how to do my own thing that, like you said, Lainey, kind of plays on those things that I like there, a trope Mm -hmm. or a character, a concept, Um, And then also, I'm very inspired by nonfiction. I love to read journalism, especially long-form journalism, true stories, true crime, history. Uh, I love the idea that truth is stranger than fiction and can often spark really interesting ideas. Yeah, I also get my ideas from usually other sources of media, um, but all of my ideas are a a mashup of other ideas. You know, like I'll choose one aspect of one TV show and mash that with a a trope that I love and a a character archetype from another movie that I enjoyed. Um, Or like Alexa, you said, um, things executed poorly or not done very well. Like I, I love taking that, like if I were to take that basic premise where would I go with that instead? Like, how would I fix it kind of situation? Not to sound like completely conceited, but sometimes I'm like, I want to do that, but I want to do it better. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I really think that's a great place to start personally. Um, but how do you guys determine whether the idea that you have is enough to support an entire novel rather than, say, a short story? Because I think it's, this is a really important component that many newer writers don't necessarily have. They have a nugget of an idea, but can it sustain 80,000 words? Well, I 
only have ideas in novel form. Like I, I, my ideas tend to get bigger and bigger because I tend to add more and more to it. You know, I'll start with one nugget of an idea and then I'll add a trope that I like and then another trope that I like. And then these tropes blend in a way that I need to add this backstory for this character. And it just gets bigger and bigger until it's a novel or more than one. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I force myself to think in novel terms because mm. I'm not really good at short fiction anyway. So I can't ever think whenever I did short stories in college, I'm always like this could be a novel and it's really hard for me to scale back into something that's a shorter story. Um, but yeah, so I just automatically go in thinking this is going to be a novel idea and it comes down to the brainstorming aspect of it. How can I sustain an entire story on this one idea that I have? Yeah, same. I also cannot write a short story to save my life now, but uh, I used to write fan fiction and all of my fan fiction was quite short in the sense that it was all kind of zingy high concepts that maybe could sustain 10K, maybe 20K. But when it comes to novels and novel concepts, the key is conflict and kind of B plots. So you always have an A story, which is like the main thing going on, but you should always have a B plot. And I think that's where I, I know that something is a novel if I just, I'm brainstorming and I come up with a million complications. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do, uh, just of the kind of stories that I personally like to tell, I like equal parts of like an external plot and also an internal plot that usually tends to be a romance. So like my main plot will be the characters have to do this task and then the B plot is and they fall in love while doing it. So I do have like those two stories that mingle together. I think that's a great way to approach it. And romance very often is the default B plot. Mm -hmm. That's really common in, in story structure. So how do you make sure your idea is unique? It's not something that's already been written, you know, especially if we're getting influence from, you know, other sources, other TV shows, books, movies. How, how do we make sure that our idea is unique? Well, two things. One, no story is truly unique. There's, there can be unique execution um, and the way that you write something. But just to reassure writers, like everything has technically been done. It's really hard to reinvent the wheel. There, there's only so many stories and so many tropes. So free yourself a bit from that. However, it doesn't mean that you get to write a YA dystopian novel about a bunch of kids who are thrown into an arena and have to kill each other because that is the Hunger Games. So there is such thing as you need to know the market. You need to be familiar with what is already out there, not just in books. You do need to consider popular culture like movies and television. Although what's popular in movies and television doesn't always translate to fiction, which is a whole other topic. So my thing is that you should be reading a ton mm -hmm. and reading in your genre that you want to write so you know what's out there. And also getting specific, because while a general idea might be something that's done before, you can get really specific into character relationships or character backstory and give it a really different and unique flavor. Yeah, and I also think that while general concepts can be mostly the same throughout the genre, the characters are what's going to make it the most different in your story, I believe. Yeah, I mean, that's why the romance genre is so popular. You know, you'll see a lot of very similar tropey stories, but you can still love them and they still bring something new and fresh in unique characters and a unique dynamic between those characters. Mm -hmm. Speaking of characters, <laughs> let's talk about characters and conflicts and stakes. Which I think are, if this were a cake, if, the, if your book were a cake, because I love awkward food metaphors, these would be your three essential ingredients. You can't have a book without these three things. So first you have to figure out obviously who your main character is. And this is the person through whose eyes and perspective you're going to tell the story. You might have multi POV, but wow, let's save that for another day. So <laughs> let's assume you have one core character. What do they want? That's the first thing you should figure out. Not just what they want, but what they need. Mm -hmm. Who is your character? What do they want? What do they need? And what is stopping them from getting those two things? And then one of the most important is, is what happens if they don't get it. That is where you get the stakes of the story. Well, and I think that in, in any given story, there's going to be multiple wants and multiple 
conflict drivers, so things standing in the way. And there can be multiple levels of stakes. So it's not just external, like a literal thing that someone wants, but it's also the internal kind of this this kind of gets to the need, the thing that they might not even articulate that they, they, they need. So for example, in Harry Potter, it's that he needs family and he has this need to be loved and accepted, but Harry's not actually articulating any of that. He's going on a quest and his want is to fix the thing. Yeah. Also for like first books, I feel like I did not really pay attention too much to conflicts and stakes, even though I know I had them in my story. I didn't really know. I guess I just wasn't knowledgeable enough to really apply those things. And I, maybe that filters into my process it is now. While I kind of always know what my characters kind of want, kind of need, kind of know what's in the way, um, it's something that always changes over the drafts. So I don't want someone to think like, well, I don't have all these things. And that prevents them from moving forward. It's a discovery while you're writing. Some of these things will come to you. Absolutely agree. And in fact, kind of that internalized need and, and the, the conflict and stakes there, you might not, you generally, I don't think, know it when you start. Mm-hmm. I think it's more important to start with character because stories at their core are about the changes a character goes through, who they are at the beginning and who they are at the end. Absolutely. And going back to the ideas question and determining if you have enough for a book, think about that character. Are they experiencing enough change? And when you're planning to write your novel, you want to really think about the journey that that character is going to go on. And if you don't actually have anything planned where your main character is going to change... You have to go back to the drawing board on having enough for a full story. A novel isn't just like a moment in someone's life. It's there's a start and a middle and an end. And there's always a journey, even if it's not a literal like quest. I think that's the big difference between uh, novels and short stories, because short stories can just be a moment in a character's life. But a novel tracks change over... um, usually a longer period of time, but not necessarily because some novels can take place over just like a few hours. But um, they they go through a more dramatic change than in a short story. Absolutely. So let's talk about brainstorming because all of this kind of comes back to the stuff you do before you start writing. We haven't even gotten to actually writing a novel yet. And that's because brainstorming is an essential part of novel writing. But then there's always the question, how much brainstorming is actually procrastination? There's a line. Mm. Ideas do need to be developed, but there does come a point where you're spending too much time planning world building and, you know, developing this character's third cousin. And that's not a necessary part of like the preparation stage. So how do you guys approach brainstorming? Specifically, let's start with world building. How how do you develop your world? For me, my world comes as I write most of the time. When I have an idea, the first thing I do is I just like word vomit everything I'm thinking about the story that can be relationships, character, Um, subplots, everything. I'm just thinking of everything that I want, but I try to go kind of in a cohesive journey. I like to see like, oh, from the beginning, where are the characters in the beginning? And then I just keep writing and writing. It's pretty much stream of conscious um, where I don't really stop and think about it. I just see everything that I kind of see for the story. And then later I'll kind of organize that. But that helps me realize, is this a long enough story? Is there enough that can happen in it? Where are some areas that need more work? So you you physically essentially write it all down. Is it like in a Word doc? It's um in a notebook. For some reason, I oh, can't... Oh, handwriting. Yeah, I can't do brainstorming. I can't outline. I can't anything unless I'm writing it physically on like a notebook. That's a really good process tip because I, I don't do that. Kat, what about you? I like writing in a notebook as well. Ah. Yeah, there's something about it. Um, I do do some like brainstorming when I go to create my Scrivener doc and like get started in that. But it, before I start the Scrivener doc, I'm writing everything by hand in my notebook. Mm-hmm. I love that. All like the pre, pre-writing pre for me is all done in a notebook. Yeah, same. So essentially another word for brainstorming is pre-writing, mm-hmm. which is for you guys, which is funny because I don't write most of my brainstorming down. It just kind of lives in my head, which is why we're not surprised that 
I'm a pantser. <laughs> Stick a pin in that. We're going to talk about that. Well, before I get into the pre-writing, I do keep a lot of things in my head. You know, like I'll see a character dynamic in a show that I love and I'll think I want to do something with that. And then I'll just kind of test out ideas in my head until something sparks, something latches. And then I go to the pre-writing and start writing it down. But I, I do like let ideas kind of percolate in my head for a little bit before I go to pre-writing. Sometimes I don't want to write things down physically where I'm just like, well, it's in my head. That's fine. It's up there. But what I always find when I actually am like, okay, take that idea from your head and start writing it down. I come up with better ideas and more mm. ideas come from that when I'm like, okay, time to take that idea and put it down into a notebook. And it, I just get so many more inspiration and ideas from that. Yeah. So when I'm brainstorming, uh, much like Lainey, I, my world building is kind of just as I go filling it in. My pre-writing and brainstorming usually stems from character. I'll start with my character and I will ask the most basic questions like, who is this character? What do they want? What are they doing? What is their life like? How do they spend a day? Like just your basic what, where, when, who, how, why kind of questions. And I'll ask a lot of different variations of those. Like what do they want? What do they like? What do they hate? And this is usually in the um, pre, pre-writing pre stage where it's in my head and I'm just wondering these things and I, I wait until I start having some solid answers. And that's when I start writing things down. Same. Uh, ish. I, <laughs> even you asking all those questions overwhelms me slightly, which is <laughs> Well, which I, is I don't have to answer all of them. I just wonder them and, you know, think about possibilities. And some get answered, some don't. It's when I find an answer that really sticks that I'm like, this is where we're going to build from. Nice. Well, I tend to build from personality hobbies mm. and also kind of background like backstory I tend to ask myself what what are their hobbies uh what are their career aspirations and however that and usually answering that also helps me with my world building like because your career aspirations are definitely dependent on your world where you are kind of the conditions and I I'll often ask myself well who are their parents how were they raised and how did that impact their personality? Because I, I like to think, what's their core strength? Like, what is the center of this character? Whether it's uh, they have a strong moral core or they're a hothead or whatever it might be. Uh, they're deeply insecure. That's easy to write. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I, that's where I like to start. Kind of the building blocks of personality. But then, of course... I don't really figure it out till I start writing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for me also names, figuring out character names is a huge part of the brainstorming pre-writing process. Oh yeah. Yeah. How do you guys figure out names and do you do it ahead of time? Lainey, you're laughing. <laughs> so I feel like you have something to say. So I have this thing where the whole name has to encompass the character. It's like when you like, you just automatically can picture the character in your head based on the name alone. So I cannot move forward in writing unless I have the character names down. Even side characters, I have to know a side character's name if they have like a more importance in the story. But like cameo characters or characters that are like are only in for like a scene or so, I don't need a name. I just kind of say name and then move on. But I, I will scour the internet for character name lists. And what I will do in my brainstorming pre-writing stage, I'll write down all the character names that I like in a notebook and that way I can reference them while I'm writing and be like okay these are the names I know I like they, they fit the tone of the story and the time period I guess or whatever and I can like choose I'm like oh yeah I liked that name I can use this character name for this one but like my main main characters always have to have like sick names that just like feel right for the character we are twinsies <laughs> that is really similar to me where like I cannot start writing <laughs> until I have those names. And you're right. They have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And, but I also know that once I start the character name document in my Scrivener, it's going to be a real book. Shit gets real when I'm pinning down character names. Sometimes character names just like fly into my head. Like one of my characters in the current book, current book I'm writing, I'm like, oh yeah, that's totally her name. And then I'm like, okay, well, let's move on. And I love when that happens. I'm always just so overwhelmed when I have to look up character names. 
Yeah, I am the same (laughs) as both of you. I cannot start writing unless I have at least my central character and like their immediate, you know, the, the major character names. For my most recent project, I spent about three days kind of developing the idea before I started writing it. And two days were like plotting and planning and like building around the premise. And one full day was just spent focused on the character names because I had to like look up a bunch of different names, check out their meanings and see if they went together, but like weren't too similar. And I also needed to make sure that my two characters names, because I have two main characters and it is a romance, I needed to make sure that their ship name was good. (laughs) Nice. One potential name that I had actually got vetoed because it just didn't blend well with the other (laughs) name. And I was like, I need a whole other name. So you guys do look up the meaning of the names? Because I just realized I don't look up the meanings of the names. I don't always. It really depends. So an example where I did would be um, both of my space books, my sci-fi books, uh, because I wanted purposely wanted to have certain names that had spacey connotations so i'd Mm. work backwards in that case um but normally especially for contemporary i i don't try to be so like exact that it's like this person is a volunteer person who's passionate about helping people and their name is alex yes that's what my name means alexa means helper of mankind which is why amazon has co-opted it (laughs) my echo is literally lit up right now yeah there she goes yeah i don't always look up the character names first but like after i find a name that i like i will look it up just to make sure the meaning doesn't contradict what i feel like is the core of that character so i don't necessarily build them around what they mean but I, I do like to make sure that the meaning does kind of align with who they are. I'm going to have to do that after the show. I'm going to have to look them up. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say one thing. Um, this all said, as exact as we try to be, have you guys ever done the classic find and replace someone's name? Because I have had to oh, do that. Yeah. Like, because I have used placeholder names of people I know. <laughs> it almost never works out. You always have to change it. So don't get too deep into the trap. I I literally was copy editing my debut novel like oh shit I have to change this name (laughs) whoops okay what I have a funny story with one of my characters in one of my other books so he ended up becoming a bigger character and then he became the love interest and then I realized I really hate his name and I like couldn't figure out a better name for him because back when he was a side character I'm like I don't care what his name is this sounds good so I had to like really look and find and I sent like my critique partner all of these different options and I'm like what one do you think it fits him the best and it was like a whole process. For one story that I started writing way back in the day I really really loved the two names of my two main characters a guy and a girl like those were the names for the characters and then I found out that Cassandra Clare was writing a book with those two names as her main characters, Will and Tessa. I was about to say, Tessa. (laughs) Yeah. Will and Tessa. Tessa's a great name. I also had to veto a Tessa in a book because of Cassie Clare. (laughs) Cassie! And it it wasn't just one of the names. It It was was both. It was both of them. And so I, I tried, like, fitting in other names for each of them, like, what name would also work for this character. And I I just struggled with it. So I ended up setting that idea aside for a while. Like, not only because of that, but that was definitely a factor. (laughs) Wow. So this is also an aspect of brainstorming, but it might lead us down a dangerous road. But I am going (laughs) to ask, how much plotting are you doing in your brainstorming phase? Well, for me, my brainstorming and my outlining go hand in hand within maybe a couple days of each other, maybe even the same day. So I do do extensive plotting, especially in my brainstorming, because I need to know what the overall arc of the story is before I can start plotting it. Well, then do we want to talk about outlining versus not outlining? Sure. Let's get into it. (laughs) Okay, guys, watch out. This is about to get real dark. Okay. (laughs) Well, and also we are planning to do a full episode on plotting versus pantsing because this is a huge topic with a a lot of nuance that we can get into. But generally, I guess that is to say you can outline your project before you start or you cannot outline 
your project before you start. Or you can do minimal outlining. Mm -hmm. So I love outlining, but in this beginning stage, it usually is quite minimal. You know, I I know that I have a reputation as like an intense (laughs) outliner because I have like this 27 plot point system, but they are very, very basic. And in my early stage, I usually don't even flesh out the third act at all. I just know the general beats and I'll know that like, you know, you have the final battle and the climax and the resolution. And I won't know specifically what that's going to be in this particular story, but I might have some vague idea of like what could happen. Um, But again, like Lainey, I need to know kind of the general structure of it, at least basically what happens in act one, act two and act three. But I also never really know how the story ends. Like I have like a feeling, like an emotion that I feel like where the characters need to be towards the end of the story and then how I get there. I don't know. Even though I am an extensive plotter, I usually still don't know how I'm ending the story until I'm in Act 3. Yeah, and and for all of my plotting, it isn't set in stone. You know, like, Mm -hmm. I'll do a, a rough outline for an option, and then, you know, I might get to the first act plot twist and be like, oh, actually, this is a different story than what I originally planned, and I have no problem throwing out an outline completely and doing a new outline. Which brings us to story structure, because this is really an essential ingredient, going back to my awkward baking metaphors, in the cake of your novel. I I think it is really important to have a decent grasp of story structure, either internalized, whether you've ever read a craft book or not, or you do the work to understand the mechanics of story. So I do not outline. However, I always have primary beats in mind. I always know my inciting incident. I almost always know what I call the midpoint turn, like the twist in the middle. And I often know my break into three, which is like the double twist, like the the next big dramatic thing that takes me into the end. I may not know 90% of the finer points between that, most of the beats, but I have those things in mind. So maybe let's talk a bit about story structure, story beats, what the heck we're talking about. Because I I think that if you're here and you're listening to this because you're like, how the heck do I even write a book? This this is like the flour for your cake Mm. or butter. The thing. Yeah, butter. It's going to (laughs) stick your story together. I will stop with baking metaphors. (laughs) I think the unifying aspect of story is that no matter what kind of structure you write with, or if you're a plotter or a pantser, you're still going to have a a plot twist at about the 25% mark and a midpoint turn at about the 50% mark and another plot twist at about the 75% mark. Like that's just kind of the natural story structure. And I feel like a lot of different story structure methods that we try to like form around a story is just us trying to identify like a natural story pattern and just us putting our own structure and words to something that just kind of exists on its own. Yeah. So I'm thinking back to my first book and I did, I didn't really know what beats were. I didn't really outline to like a three act structure, which is what I do now. But I feel like if you are a natural lover of any type of story, whether that be books or visual media, you're you're going to know like the natural progression of what a story is when you're writing it. And I feel like even though I didn't know any of these things in my first book, if I were to read it back, I would I would vaguely see all the plot or the plot beats there. I just never knew what they were and they might not be in the exact percentage point where it generally should be. So I don't think you should be stressing out about plot beats right now <laughs> if you're like this is yeah, your first book. Yeah. Exactly what you said. If you're someone who regularly reads or watches movies or TV shows, then you kind of just instinctually will get a sort of a sense of the story structure. And when you try to do it yourself, you might not necessarily n- be intentionally doing things or like be able to articulate what exactly you're doing but you do have kind of a vague sense of like how it progresses and I, I, again like your your pacing could be completely off be, which is I, I think a, a big aspect of newer writers who don't have a, a really firm grasp of story structure is they know like vaguely things are supposed to be happening but they might be taking too long to get there or get there too quickly. So pacing tends to be a a big struggle to learn. 
but that's a 201 yeah. problem. Yeah, that's that that is that's a, that's a whole other episode too. <laughs> but I literally did that with my first book. In hindsight, like I wrote the whole draft and a friend pointed out that my midpoint turn was in the third act. She's like, nothing happens for two thirds of the book. And I learned, oh, pacing. (laughs) That said, I do think in terms of if you're sitting down to try to write your first book, regardless of whether you're going to end up as an outliner, I think it's a great idea to try to try outlining. And often that means looking up story structure and uh, possibly a beat sheet. Um, And we can link to, in our show notes, some craft resources that we recommend. Uh, Craft books that were helpful to us. Uh, I will definitely link to a beat sheet. But I I think that when you're in the, am I going to outline this book decision phase of pre-writing, that it's always worth trying. And I say that as someone who hates outlines. I was going to say, I love that you're the one saying this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, because an essential part of my process when I was trying to figure out how to write books was trying trying tons of advice that people were giving and trying, I mean, outlining is the status quo for a reason. You don't pants because you don't want to outline. You pants because you're incapable of outlining after trying it, (laughs) is my view of it. Um, Because pantsing is hard. Yeah, like even my first outline of my first book was half a page bullet points. That's that was my outlining for my first book. So it's basically it was just kind of pantsing but I always knew what I was working towards each bullet point I was working towards that I was working towards that well that's actually a great point that maybe the advice to give is have something to work towards even if it's three key scenes you know you want to write that speak to the journey of the character um that's a great place to start and speaking of starting um I would love to talk a bit about tools Because I I think what is intimidating about the first time you write a novel and the how the heck do you even write a novel question is how the heck do you even write a novel? There are there are tools. None of them are magic, but they can help having your tools before you. So what are the essential tools for you guys? For me, number one is a notebook, because I, I do really love the pen on paper, that like direct visual approach. Uh, I I find a lot of value in that. It it somehow just really helps me. So a a notebook is definitely a a vital tool for me. And second to that is Scrivener. Scrivener is totally vital to me. Uh, My first novel I wrote in Microsoft Word, but I love Scrivener for its ability to jump around. You know, you can work on chapter one and then just with one click you're in chapter 27 and you don't have to like scroll. It's just, it, it makes it much easier for me as a planner. And I, I like looking at it from like a, a bird's eye view and then narrowing in and Scrivener really enables me in that way. So hard same. Uh, this is going to be the Scrivener love hour, <laughs> yeah. but let's talk about what Scrivener is. And, and really at the heart of it, you need some kind of word processing tool. You're going to have to type your novel at some point, whether you're writing the first draft longhand or You could even use a typewriter. They make digital typewriters, but you have to input your story somewhere. And Microsoft Word or its variations are definitely the default, but I was incapable of writing a novel until I got Scrivener. Scrivener unlocked the novel writing process for me and it's that bird's eye view. I don't jump around, I write chronologically, but I needed those folders and each folder is a chapter. I needed to be able to compartmentalize like that and it also, Scrivener does everything. What is Scrivener? Scrivener is the best. Um, it, it is a word processing tool developed by novelists for novelists, essentially. And, and not just novelists. There's also screenwriting. screenwriting. Aspects we don't care about story. them. <laughs> I'm kidding. They're great. Actually, they might have been developed by screenwriters. I might be wrong. I, yeah, I don't know who. They're, they're definitely writers. They're storytellers. Whoever it is, they understand me and my soul. Yeah. So. so I'm actually kind of the opposite. <laughs> <gasps> kind Larry. of kind of kind of <laughs> oh my god no so i draft in google docs and mm. one of the reasons i do this is because hopefully my job is not listening but i draft while i'm at work <laughs> i have three screens that i can do all my work on at, at my job and one screen always has my google doc up because I just start typing in there and it's just easier for me to have my draft in my google doc but then we're not talking about revision, but revision, I switched to Scrivener then. But drafting is for Google Docs because I can do it at work. Do you 
right strictly chronologically or do you jump around when you're drafting? Oh, I chronological all the way. It's the whole journey. I can't, I can't, I don't have no idea what my characters are going to think in at chapter 15 when I'm writing chapter two. Like for me, it's like I have to go through the emotional journey of the character and that just helps with chronological. I I actually know even I revise and chronologically too. So I can't even say I jump around during then, but wow. Yeah. Can't I'm, relate. <laughs> I'm the same. Sorry. Yeah. But I do love Scrivener. I do love Scrivener. So I just don't use it for drafting. And it's okay. You guys don't have to apologize for being chronological, right? <laughs> I honestly think that I might have an easier time if I were a chronological writer because I would, you know, I have to do revisions in chronological order because that's where I really fix the story. But I'm also a fast drafter. So if I'm drafting and I know that, you know, a scene is supposed to go here, but I don't know what happens. I might skip it for the time being and work on something later on because I have a clear vision of like what that scene is going to be. You know, there's different um, subplots in a story. I might follow one all the way through the story, jumping around just to like link that up. And of course, things change in revisions. But when I'm drafting, especially fast drafting, I love the freedom of being able to write anywhere in the document. So just another tool that I want to touch on that has become essential for me. I wish I'd had this from the start when I was writing books, and that is a planner. And specifically, I use star stickers to motivate myself to write. And I basically track my drafting process in a planner, and it can be any kind of day planner. I happen to have, uh, I have a passion planner and a clever fox planner. Those are the two that I've been using. Um, and essentially, I give myself a gold star, literally, though, the, I mean, they're multicolored, but I give myself a shiny star for every 500 words that I write. And it's a way for me to track my daily word counts, to keep myself on track to write daily, and kind of be able to see the progress of my writing in front of me, it really keeps me motivated. And so having my planner and my stickers and my colored pens, I bought a whole set, Having that ready is a really essential part of drafting for me, and I recommend it to all writers, Um, especially if it's your first time, then you'll have this keepsake of the process of writing your novel is there. I also use the Clever Fox Planner. Um, I also do the stickers too. Mine's like for a thousand words in one project, or I edited one chapter in another since I'm currently drafting and revising. But I love seeing like on the monthly spread, all those stickers at the end of the month makes me feel good yeah well and you start to see patterns in your own work and your own writing like the obvious one for for me with a day job is I write less on work days and that's fine uh but you know and also you you see how much you can write in a month I just I love the tracking and this is not necessarily a writing tool but NaNoWriMo, which uh, it also provides kind of a way to track your word count and to stay on track and also fast drafting. I I love fast drafting. I've drafted most of my novels either during NaNoWriMo or at a NaNoWriMo-ish pace where you're writing about 1,600 words a day for 30 days to write a 50,000 word rough draft in a month. And NaNoWriMo has really helped me Uh, especially in the beginning. It helped me stay on track. There's also the community aspect because so many other people participate and there's encouragement and you you can relate with people who are struggling. Uh, So NaNoWriMo, not necessarily a tool exactly, but an approach. I think it counts as a tool. Yeah, I think it kind of counts. It's it's an approach. It's a method. A tool is anything that you can surround yourself with, a mechanism by which you write. Uh, And so just another one that I'll throw in, music. Having playlists ready or specific music, like I love movie soundtracks, having that ready to go can be really essential for pushing you with writing. Also, like certain songs that I have on playlists, when I hear them in any other capacity, it like triggers my brain and puts me right back into the story. I have things like that that I refer to as writing triggers, where it's like certain songs or uh, a certain candle that I always light while I'm writing. So like that scent just like brings me back into the story or a certain coffee creamer I'll always use like for my coffee. So like that's my writing coffee. That's my writing drink. 
um, and just like little writing ritual things to get me in the mood. Though you don't want to rely too heavily on writing rituals or you'll have trouble writing outside of doing those things. Pros and cons to writing mm-hmm. rituals. Yeah. So let's dive into actually starting. I, I would love to talk a bit about the first line, the first scene, the first chapter. How do you know you're starting in the right place? Like, do first lines and first scenes just come to you? Do you plan them for a long time? Do you change them later if you don't nail it? on the first draft, because I feel like the hardest part is starting. This is where it benefits me to jump around because (laughs) I don't, I found that my start, my opening scene, I do want it to be just right. So I often don't start with that. I'll start in like chapter two and build some momentum before I know like what I want my opening scene to be. Huh. Interesting. I'm so different. Yeah. <laughs> both both leaning are like excuse. <laughs> Personally, first lines just come to me. And I know once I have a first line and the first line tends to crystallize into a scene. And once I have that, it almost never changes. Mm. And I know I can write a book if I can write the first line and like the first scene. Uh, so my two published books did not change the first chapters, the first scenes, the first moment. Um, And I I suspect, knock on wood, it's going to be the same with the next one. Just like a line came to me on a plane and I pulled out my phone and I just started swiping in Google Docs and I was like, now I can write this book. So do you need the first line to start then? Yes, weirdly. It's gross. It's not a good thing. But I, I need a perfect zinger that one zingy line opens up the whole book for me because starting in the right place is really critical Mm. um your opening scene paints a picture of the world it tells the reader who your character is what they want there should be a hint of what's standing in their way though not necessarily uh you don't want to drop right into the middle of action where the reader has no context for the action or the character but you also don't want to drag it out and have it be boring. So <laughs> I think that every time I start a book, I'm like, yeah, this is going to be the opening scene. And then it's not. <laughs> like, I was like so dead set on this one chapter to be the opening chapter for one of my previous books. And I'm like, this is it. Like, I totally feel it. It's, you know, it's good. And then when I rewrote it last year, that ended up changing to like the second chapter. And I had to like have it like a different chapter be chapter one. And I'm like, wow, I never thought I would change that first chapter. But whatever, at least it's still there, but it's just chapter two. And then for my current revision uh, for my YA fantasy, yeah, I just totally ditched that first one. And it is, it's a completely different setup. It's a completely new act act one in general. I had to rewrite the entire thing. But everything I think that's going to be the first chapter, it's not. I've come to realize that. So, (laughs) (laughs) Well, I feel I just jinxed myself that my my comeuppance is coming. Well, you have two. I actually... You have two in the back burner that's like, yeah, this is it. You're like, you deserve punishment, (laughs) Alexa. (laughs) Watch it be my next book. See, I usually have an idea for the opening scene. Like, I'll know vaguely what's happening in that scene, but I won't necessarily have the opening line for a while or, like, know exactly how we start that scene. I'll just know, like, the meat of what happens. And, like, because you need to know, like, where your character is starting off at the beginning. You need to get a glimpse of who they are and where they are at life, like the, that stasis point before you, you introduce the inciting incident and everything changes. We need to know what we're changing from. So I will have an idea for the opening scene, but I like having a, I I call it like a first line approach to every single chapter where I try to make the first line of every chapter almost feel like it's the first line of a book. Like it, it is like that one line zinger that kind of like sets the scene and starts you off and like kicks you right into motion. So I like doing that for every chapter. And sometimes it takes a while to like get that perfect line. But I do generally know like vaguely what happens in my opening scene before I like jump to chapter two and start writing there or something. So I think the final piece of the puzzle, because we can't possibly jump into every single aspect of what really goes into a novel, because this would be a 10 hour long podcast. But I would love to talk about the mechanics of actually writing, how to actually make butt in chair words on the page happen. Because I think this is the missing link for a lot of people. How do you actually do it? So for me, first off, identifying a time to write is very important, partly because I have a day job 
and I have to carve out time to write. And I think it's important to know what kind of person you are, essentially. So like if you're a morning person, it might be getting up early to write. But if you're a night owl, it's writing at night. And it's carving out that time and then religiously sticking to it. I think experimentation is really important here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, try writing early in the morning. Try writing late at night. Try not having a schedule at all. Um, although I don't necessarily recommend that unless you're very disciplined. Because yeah. otherwise you'll just, you'll never write. You'll never write. <laughs> you know, try writing for an hour a day. Try writing 500 words a day. You know, experiment with different goals in different settings. And, and just try to find what works for you. Because you can listen to us tell you our processes all day long. But that approach might not work for you. So you just need to try a lot of things. Yep. And I think that those writing routines come in here as well. You know, it's creating a space and an environment where you write there, you write in that situation. So, you know, for me, it's 10 p.m. I turn the TV off. I turn on my music and I write until bed. And like that is my mode. That is what works for me. But when that stopped working, which it did when I was on deadline, it was going to coffee shops for four to five hours and not coming home until I'd written 1,500 words. So you have to try different things. Yeah. And, and I also think setting a deadline for yourself is really helpful. Sometimes they are external, like who, someone who's paying you tells you to write a book. But on the first book, you're only beholden to yourself. Yeah, I agree with changing up. Because I'm thinking of all the different ways that I've done my writing routines in the past year and a half and every I feel like every season I tend to switch it up and change it and find something that works for me better I like doing like every day after work um, I'll eat dinner watch one episode of the current ep- uh, the current show I'm binge watching and then I'll start writing for the rest of the night um, I've also done really early in the morning before for like a week I did that for as like a challenge but I also think like if you're like an author tuber or a YouTuber in general, a huge part of my writing routine is because I do a lot of weekly writing vlogs and that really holds me accountable because you feel guilty. Yeah, I don't want people to see me doing nothing on my YouTube channel. Same. <laughs> me. <laughs> so the solution is start a YouTube yep. channel, everyone. <laughs> I honestly, accountability is a huge thing, Um, especially like writing can be a very solitary thing. And when you're all on your own and you're a new writer, you don't have like a book contract, you don't have external deadlines. Yeah, accountability was a huge thing for me. That's again why I like NaNoWriMo because you sign up for it and you publicly tell people you're doing it and then you have to follow through. Like publicly announce what you're doing so you feel very guilty if you if you fail at it. Just going off the NaNoWriMo thing, all of my recent projects have all been because I did NaNoWriMo. All, mm-hmm. all three of the projects that I'm like kind of juggling right now, the first draft was written during NaNoWriMo. It's such a good tool, I guess. It is a tool mm-hmm. um, because it makes you, it really pushes yourself. And again, it's not going to work for everyone. Um, You know, there are some people who just cannot maintain that NaNoWriMo pace, and that's completely valid. I feel called out, Kat. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm kidding. Hey, you wrote the most on our writing retreat. (laughs) Well, I'm the same with NaNo. I I think this is the NaNo fan podcast. Almost every novel project I've started was started during a NaNo period. My debut novel was a nano novel, the one and only time I have successfully completed nano. But all the other ones, even accomplishing 20,000 words of a novel in a month is huge for me. And nano provided that motivation to st- even start something. I think it's valuable whether you quote unquote win nano or not, for sure. It's. Oh, oh yeah. I've, yeah. I've only won about half of the nano rhymes I've participated in. But I still swear by them. I still love yeah. them because it's it's still worth participating in it just for that like kick in the butt to get you going and to give you a schedule and deadlines and goals and community. Mm-hmm. And another thing that helps with actually getting the writing done, and this comes up a lot in Nano, and Nano provides the community for it, and that is writing sprints. Mm. This is a specific challenge environment that can help you get raw words on the page. I think we all participate in writing sprints and use this as a tool Mm -hmm. and you can always find strangers on the internet who are doing them you don't even need to do them with other people i I tend to do most of mine 
on my own. You know, I'll just set a timer for 20 minutes and then do focused work for 20 minutes and then take a break. Yeah, it really helps with uh, procrastination because just last week, it was like I was really lazy. Like I had my Word doc open. I was supposed to be writing, but I'm like, okay, I'm being distracted by all the other things right now. I'm just going to set a 15 minute sprint and just do what I can in that in that time frame. And then I produced words. So it's really helpful doing it by yourself too. Yeah, it's back to that thing of like writing a book is hard and it is a very daunting task. And when you think about like all the work left to do on your book, that can be a little overwhelming and make you like resistant to even start. But if you have a, a 15 minute or a 20 minute timer, like it, it's much lo- lower pressure. Like you just have to write for, you just have to work for 20 minutes. Like you don't need to write the whole book right now. Just do 20 minutes of work and that's an accomplishment. And, and that kind of mentality can really help you get started and like get over that procrastination. Well, and same thing with word count goals. I think it's also helpful to break those down. Mm. Nano provides the guideline of about 1600 words a day, but you can also do smaller word count increments. It could be 250 words. Maybe that's what you do in a 15 minute sprint Uh, with the star stickers that Lainey and I do the stickers in the planner. Um, your increment is 1000 words. My increment is 500 words, which I've done. I've calibrated that to, I tend to write more slowly. I have a lower word count that I tend to hit, but also I like to have more stars. I am selfish, (laughs) but it's, you can calibrate your word count goals to fit your writing, whatever it takes for you to feel accomplished, but know that anytime you write any words, you're making progress. It takes tons and tons and tons of writing sessions to add up to a book whether it's 30 days at 1600 words a day or it's six months and it's 100 words a day whatever that math works out to be i'm not good at math i write books i actually have i found a great quote that i like retweeted the other day that kind of goes along with this writing a book is like having an empty pool in the yard and every day going out and throwing in a cup of water to fill it that is painful and so accurate i know (laughs) and and that's by bethany ball i love that i just i had to retweet that because i was like oh that's true (laughs) so yeah just so having patience with yourself is is a big one because you can't do this overnight like even if you're doing NaNoWriMo you're just writing a rough draft in those 30 days like it's still gonna take a lot more work so like writing a novel is definitely a marathon not a sprint and I think this the patience also ties into perfectionism Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the goal when you're writing a first draft of of a novel isn't perfection it's just progress it's it's that, that that one quote um perfection is the enemy of progress yes and I think that a lot of us get wrapped up in that. I, I One of the reasons I think m- most writers, many writers, give up when they're trying to write a novel, I speak as someone who gave up on several before I successfully finished one, I think we all have similar stories, was obsessing over making it perfect the first time. And I found myself editing what I'd written over and over again instead of moving forward. And so one thing that I think is really critical to go into your first draft knowing or trying to do and you essentially have to fight your worst impulses and our worst impulses are to make it perfect you have to allow yourself to be quote unquote bad but i promise later when you go back it's usually not as bad as you think it is Mm -hmm. yeah i feel like i went into novel writing with some very bad habits like when i was in college i was very used to writing my papers once going through proofreading turning it in getting an a and then when i the novel writing part is just completely different and i had to i'm still fighting that that it's not going to be perfect it's really not going to be perfect and you have to work on it but the perfectionism part of it is just it's hard to like spend all your time on a book and come out on the other side and know it's not good it, it's it's good but it's, it's really not good So it's like, I feel like I like didn't really waste time, but I'm like, I've been working so hard on this and why isn't it good enough? But it's just the first draft and that took me a very long time to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely how it feels. Like you, you did the marathon, you passed the finish line, but then they, they put another marathon in front of you and you're like, why are you doing this to me? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I think another uh, important aspect to actually writing is to prioritize actually writing. 
Yes. Um, you know, people will say like, oh, I, I wish I had the time to write a novel. And it's like you do if you make the time for it, if you trim other things in your life. Like you've been listening to this podcast for an hour. You could have been writing for an hour. <laughs> Hey, everyone has to refill the well sometimes. True, very true. Rate and subscribe. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that actually, that speaks both to pushing yourself, making the time. It's it's absolutely true. But also finding balance. Because I I think you do have to strike a balance. You know, we're talking about the patience and the perfectionism, breaking it into attainable goals. But also knowing the difference between I am being lazy, I can push myself, and knowing when you do need a break. Sometimes you do need to take a short break to refill your well as you're drafting. I think ultimately, you have to really want it. You have to Mm. actually really want not just to write, but to finish. And you have to go back to the writing over and over again for you. If you're not genuinely invested and you don't have the pure passion to write which sounds so cheesy it's like passion it's passion meets discipline then you're not going to make it if if you're looking for external validation or for anyone to make it easy for you because you know you know you don't have the time yeah you make the time then it's not going to happen well like my final wisdom of it all is that when I write now I just know that most of this is going to change so just write what you feel at the time and then know once I finish it I can fix it but I will say to that point that the hardest part about finishing your first novel is finishing your first novel. The first book is the hardest book you'll ever write because you don't know yet whether or not you can do it. But once you successfully write a novel, you know you can do it. So even if it's hard every other time, you've proven to yourself you can do it once. And so that's why the first book is the hardest and the key is not giving up. And yeah, back to the, um, you know, I don't have time to write a book mentality. Like, there's definitely sacrifice involved. Like, you might have to trim something, at least for a while while you work on this book, if it's important to you. Action expresses priority, not your words. You can't just say, like, writing is important to me. You have to actually take action and show that it's important to you. Now it is time for our Patreon question of the week, which is well suited to the topic. Colby Johnson has a question about scenes and chapter breaks, essentially how you figure out in your story where your chapters are, how long your scenes and chapters are. So how, how do you guys navigate that? Do you have set word counts? Do you feel it organically? Uh, well, for me, it really varies from project to project. Um, some projects, the chapters are longer. They're like three or 4,000 words for a chapter. And like, there might be a scene break or maybe not. My current project, I have a lot of chapters. I think there's 54 chapters. So they are on the shorter side in between like 1,000 and 2,000 words. And most of them don't have a scene break. So it, it really varies depending on what kind of story you're telling, what pacing you're going for. You know, if you're writing a thriller, then you're going to want shorter chapters and scenes to really propel the reader through that. But if you're writing an epic fantasy, then you can have very long lingering chapters because that's kind of suited to the genre. So the genre plays a huge part in divvying up scenes and chapters. Yeah, and you kind of just have to get a feel for it. I feel that when I'm writing a scene... I have a sense of the start and the middle and the ending. It it has a rhythm to it. I'd say my personal sweet spot, minimum of 1,500 words. My chapters can go as long as three or 4,000 words. And I kind of follow the rhythm of the scene. And my chapters aren't all uniform length, Uh, especially when I'm trying to quicken my pacing in a thriller or a mystery. My chapters will get shorter at certain points of the book. And it, so there's no hard and fast rule. You just have to kind of feel it through. I will say on average, a chapter shouldn't be too many short scenes. If a scene is really short, is enough happening. But a chapter could be a single long scene or it could be a few shorter scenes. But I wouldn't make them too short personally because that may make your pacing choppy. Yeah, I feel like my sweet spot is between 1,000 to 4,000 words, but also not 
Um, they vary through chapter to chapter. I try to, and not all the time, but I always try to leave the chapter on an exciting point or a cliffhanger or something that would propel the reader forward. I do follow like the natural progression, kind of like kind of like a story within a story. That's like kind of what chapters are. They're supposed to have a beginning, middle, and end in a chapter. So I always try to follow, is there a beginning of this chapter? What's like the midpoint of the chapter? And what here is at the end, whether that be a cliffhanger or a, an end of a scene. It all depends on the word count. I feel like a lot of people kind of get hung up on how long a chapter should be. And I don't think you should really worry about that. Especially um, Colby mentioned that this was all during drafting, like pre-revision. And I would say especially during drafting, like don't worry about it because you might end up moving scenes around or deleting whole scenes. In revision, when you refine the story is really when you get a better sense for pacing and you'll get a better sense for like when you should end scenes and chapters. Yeah, so <laughs> since I draft in Google Docs, I really never know how long my chapters are. Mm -hmm. And when I transfer it all into my Scrivener, like I came across one chapter that was like 7,000 words long. And I'm like, <laughs> what was I thinking? What was I doing when I was writing this? And so, to me, 7,000 is too much for my personal kind of writing. Um, so I'm like, here we go again. <laughs> that's pretty long for YA. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's a pretty good metric. Where the, where, I mean, you had scene breaks in it, right? I don't even remember. Like... I don't think I did. <laughs> I think it was just like oh, wow. a really long scene and I'm like what the heck <laughs> so I do think on a 201 level so again it's not necessarily a drafting problem but a revision problem though this does come up in drafting for me if a chapter feels too short that is a sign to me that my what I have going on in the chapter isn't complex enough and it can push me to write more especially in a single writing session like to hit my word count to push myself because if I'm only at 900 words I know that the scene isn't complex enough. There's not enough conflict. So, but that's for, that's because I know my chapter averages, that they average longer. But if it were a Dan Brown novel, that would probably be too long for a chapter. That was not a dig on Dan Brown. What he does, he does very well. Yeah, it's just <laughs> his, his pacing style. Like... Every book cannot sustain that pacing, though. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that is going to conclude this episode. Again, thank you to all of our patrons for your support. You can check out our page at patreon.com slash novelty show, where if you become a patron, you can suggest topics for future podcasts and live show episodes, ask us questions, and also vote in polls. We also broadcast live shows every other week on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at Novelty Show and tweet us questions using hashtag novelty. Novelty show. If you like us, please subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice, and we'd really appreciate it if you can rate and review us on iTunes and Google Play. Doing so helps bump us up in the ratings, which helps other listeners find us. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time, happy writing.